Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year, lesson number 22. Let's start with prayer. Lord, we thank you once again for this opportunity to study your word and let your Holy Spirit open up our hearts and our minds to gain more insight and wisdom um, to live out your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to be finishing up 1 Chronicles and heading into 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament. And we'll start with question number one. What did David do right before his death in chapter 22? Um, five through six. And actually, this is kind of go back a little bit into last week's, a little bit carry over into this week. And, and what he did before he died was, you know, he raised the necessary funds to, you know, to make this temple, all the resources needed, also did all the arch architectural work and, and did a lot of the, you know, the heavy lifting to kind of prepare the way for Solomon then to build the temple. He was not allowed himself to to build a temple because he had shed too much blood. And so that was going to be delegated to, to Solomon. But David made sure that all the details were set up before his death for the building of the temple. Question two, what musical instruments are used in worship in 25-6? And, you know, we see, once again here, the use of cymbals, harps, lyres is kind of like a type of guitar and stringed instruments. And, and so, again, um, every culture has different ways to worship God. There's no one way that's any better than another way. Um, we probably have our own desires on how we want to worship God, and, and that's fine. And God allows for that as long as we realize that, that um, people are different, how they're going to worship God in their different cultures and with the instruments that that culture uses. Question three. How would they determine which family did each assigned job? And so things were kind of laid out with... You know, there's a lot of work to be done in the Israelite um, community. And, um, and so what took place was different lots were cast as far as the different assignments that different people had for caring for different things regarding worship or the community and even the, the work that was, was done in and around the temple. And so they would cast lots and, and you know, had a list of all the different jobs and they would cast lots to determine who would do which thing. What do we learn about God in 28.9? And we see once again in, in Scripture that God knows every detail about us. He knows us more than we know ourselves. He knows what's going on in our heart. He knows what's going on in our mind. And He wants us to serve and worship Him with our, the fullness of our heart, the fullness of our, our soul. And if, if we truly seek Him, we will, we will find Him. Um, at the same time, if we reject Him, as it talks about there, He will reject us even though he'll continue to love us. But, you know, he's an interesting father insofar as he doesn't force us to worship him. Our God does not force us to, you know, to give our lives to him, but he wants us in our free will to choose to worship him and to, to love him. And, and so, he, you know, he gives us the freedom to choose the direction we want to go in this life and his desire is for us to choose to follow him and live for him. Question five. How much did David give toward the building of the temple? And how did the rest of the people respond in their giving? And you know, the amount that David gives is it's, it's an astronomical amount. Um, he gives 3,000 talents of gold, which would be 225,000 pounds of gold for each talent, like 75 pounds, and 7,000 talents of silver, which would be more than 500,000 pounds of silver. That's what he gave. And then the leaders gave a lot and the people responded as well. And, and, and so to think about what was in this temple, the, the incredible amount of wealth and resources poured into building this incredible place of worship for God. It was probably one of the greatest structures ever built by mankind with the desire to give God the very best. And so David led by example and the leaders gave their pledges and the people would follow. And, and so again, um, you know, example by leadership and starting with David on down the line as far as the free will offering they gave. This is above and beyond their normal tithing and what they gave for the work of, of the church and of serving God. Question six, compare the accounts of Solomon's encounter with God in Second Chronicles 1, 7 through 12 and 1 Kings 3, 5 through 15 are the two accounts in agreement. And the accounts are very similar in a lot of ways, except we see in, in 1 Kings, it's very clearly laid out that it's a dream. Whereas in Chronicles, it's, it almost 
lays out more as a, an encounter directly with God, and it doesn't mean it's a contradiction. You know, even if it, it was in a dream, it's still, he kind of focuses more on the direct encounter, because God can encounter us through a dream, he can encounter us in, in real life, but it doesn't really talk about the dream as much in Chronicles as it does in, in Kings to lay out that situation. Some people may say it's a contradiction, it really isn't. Um, because Chronicles is talking about a direct encounter with God, and obviously, as the Bible is in agreement, it was through a dream. How many men were involved in the building of the temple and the palace? And what we see is, is there is a lot of work being done in the quarries, on the site, and 153,600 men are involved in this massive construction project. That's a lot of people. And a lot of heavy lift and a lot of work that was done um, over the seven-year period that it took to build that temple. Why did Solomon desire for the temple to be great? And the reason it was meant to be great is because God is great. He's a God over all gods. And, and Solomon's desire, as well as his father David, to kind of set everything up, is, is to give God the very best. That he's the God above all gods. He deserves the very best. And, and so it was really a tribute to the love and respect they had for God and to give God um, truly one of the greatest structures that was ever built on our planet in, in history. How was, or who was Haran Abi, and where did he come from? Now, Haran Abi is, is, is um, from Tyre, and the king of Tyre lets Solomon be made aware of this incredible craftsman, and he becomes the main foreman overseeing, you know, how things were put together. He was an expert with gold and silver and um, with stone and wood and, and fabric of all different types and colors and just a, a master craftsman who oversees this massive project. And, and he was, you know, part Israelite. Um, his mom was, was um, is an Israelite, and his, his father was from Tyre, a Gentile. And so um, we see that even in Solomon's time, there is, you know, some different groups of people, different cultures are, are coming together for a common goal here to, to build this temple. Question 10. What do you think is meant by the repeated phrase, the temple for the name of the Lord? Or a temple for the Lord is also stated. And it's a place where God would dwell. Um, wherever his name is set forth, there he is. He cannot separate the name of God from, from who he is. And, and um, at the same time, we're going to see in the next question, did God only live in the temple? And 618 makes it clear, no, that's not the case. Nothing can contain God. He's, you know, he can fill anywhere he wants, the whole universe if he desires, but this is a special place where people are to encounter his presence, to pray to him, to receive forgiveness, to offer sacrifices. Um, but God is not in one place at one time. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere at one time. He can be wherever he wants to be. What is restated in 7, 19, and 20? And again, we see this same theme over and over again. It's going to repeat through the whole Old Testament, through the whole Bible. The importance of obedience. That if they followed God's laws, if they did things the way that he wanted them to, and if they would put him first, that everything would work out just fine. But if they reject him and reject his ways, then his protection will be removed. And, and they're going to go the way of the world, unfortunately, and the way of destruction. And so we see this, this theme time and time again. And and again, this repetition for us to, to lock and load our minds, the importance of, of being obedient to God's laws, which are summarized and to love God and to love our neighbors. If we live that way, there's blessing. If we don't, there's curse. Next. What do we learn from 8.1 in regards to the sequence of the building of the temple and the palace? was built first and how long did it take to build each? And so it says it's a 20 year period. So they were not built concurrently. The first, the temple was built, it took seven years. And then the palace was built, it took 13 years, which took even longer. So obviously quite the palace was built too for, for Solomon and the kings that would follow him. Next question, how did Solomon build up such great wealth? And how is Solomon described differently than he was in the previous writings, including First and Second Kings in particular? And what we see here is, is that, um, you know, as we saw previously, he had 
ships that could go out and, and you know, go over different parts of the then known world. There was explorers with these ships and they would find um, lands that maybe never had been inhabited before and they brought back all kinds of wealth from these various lands. They also had merchants, they had traders, um, and quite the commerce that was going on. This was the peak, the pinnacle of Israel's power, wealth. It was just an amazing time in history. And what's interesting is, is Solomon is, is brought to light in a much better way here than we saw previously in, in Kings. Um, he's, he's, the, the, the good things are brought out. It's not, you know, he, he obviously, we see previously that he strayed um, as he married, you know, um, numerous wives and, and concubine and, and you know, those wives led him to, to stray and worship other gods. It's not talked about here. It's talked about the, this is the pinnacle of Israel's power and, and wealth and, and basically probably the most powerful nation in the world at that time. But unfortunately, as it hits its peak with Solomon, it's going to begin to subside as the people begin to turn away from God and mainly the leaders turn away from God. And so often the direction of the leader becomes the direction of the people. How would you describe Rehoboam's reign as king? And again, as we saw earlier, you know, he is the son of Solomon and he inflicts the people with even greater taxation, greater expectations for what they are to contribute to the work of the kingdom. And the northern tribes rebel against this and they break away. The kingdom's divided during this time and, and um, Rehoboam is able to hold on to um, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and the Levites as well um, come back to Jerusalem and, and Judah as Jeroboam, the northern kingdom, rejects them and, and kind of does his own form of, of worship and unfortunately takes those people in a terrible direction as far as worshiping false gods. And, you know, so it's a very difficult time in history and, and, and Rehoboam basically does not focus on God and, and the very things that God says, if you become disobedient, things are going to go in a bad way and that's exactly what's happening during the reign of, of Rehoboam and, and Rehoboam tried to actually muster up an army to fight against the northern kingdom, but God stopped that from happening. And that concludes the Old Testament section for today. We're going to jump into John chapter 11 verse 1 through 1338. What does chapter 11 tell us about the power of Jesus over death? And what does this chapter say about the human nature and emotions of Jesus? What does this chapter say about the divine nature of Jesus? And we have this amazing story. It's, it's really interesting, in addition to the, the disciples and, and even the, the 72 that also follow along with Jesus, he had friends. And there's a family here, there's three in this, for sure in this family. There's Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they're good friends of Jesus. And, and what happens is, you know, Lazarus is very sick and they send for Jesus to come and he doesn't show up. You know, he takes some time and obviously he knows what's going to happen. And by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead. In fact, he's been dead for four days. And, and Mary and Martha, they, they talk with Jesus. And, and when Jesus sees the, their sadness and the sadness of the people there and that they're crying and weeping over the death, death of Lazarus, Jesus also weeps. In fact, there's two words in the shortest English verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, that he had compassion on them. He felt their pain. He felt their sorrow, even though he knew what he was going to do. And from there, he goes to the tomb where Lazarus had been laid four days prior. And he says, roll the stone away. And there's an odor that comes out because his body had been decomposing now for four days. And, and Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, he comes out. He he rises from the dead with this, these, you know, the, the burial cloth wrapped around him like a like a mummy, and the people are amazed that Lazarus is is alive, and they're all excited that he's alive. And here's my theory in this one, that you know Lazarus had been dead for four days. So for four days, where had Lazarus been? And I, I believe that he was obviously in the presence of paradise, the presence of of the Lord in heaven, and and. And so he leaves, has to leave heaven to come back to earth again. And all these people are excited and happy and seeing Lazarus alive. And my guess Lazarus is thinking, well, it's great seeing you again, but this really stinks. You know, I was in heaven for four days. Now I've got to come back to this place. And, and, you know, so, but still we see that Jesus has power over life. He can raise life. And this is, you know, shortly before his journey into Jerusalem where he would die on the cross. And so he's showing ahead of time that he is a, a God in human form that has power even over death. 
the next question, and by the way, too, there's some great words here. You know, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. That I love those words. And so often they're read at, at, at funerals that the death has been swallowed up in victory, that we have a God who has power over death. And the key is to believe that Jesus has his power. And, it's, and by believing in Jesus, we are saved and our sins, Satan, and death are defeated once and for all because of what Jesus has done. Question two, why did Jesus stop moving publicly among the Jews? And, you know, they were determined to arrest him. And it became a word of Jesus that he was, you know, this would happen. And so he began to focus more on the, the teaching ministry of his disciples and, and kind of staying more out of the public because his work and training the disciples was not over at this point. It wasn't his time to die yet. And so he stopped his public moving at this point. Who opposed Mary pouring perfume on Jesus and why? Now it's interesting, the one who controlled the money was not Matthew, who was a tax collector. It was Judas who controlled the money. He was the treasurer for the group. And Mary was pouring this expensive perfume on Jesus. And Judas is all upset, thinking that this perfume, this, this, you know, could be sold for a lot of money. And we could give it to the poor. And, and John stating, you know, obviously John is not very fond of Judas, that that his intention, the Judas' intention was not to give the money to the poor, but to siphon off some money for himself. And obviously, Judas had a money problem. He had a great love for money, and ultimately, he's going to betray Jesus for money. And so, you know, we see a danger here that for a lot of people, the love of money can lead to all kinds of difficulties and challenges. And that's possibly part of the problem with Judas. And we're going to see another thing coming up in a little bit here, which caused him to turn in a very bad direction. Why did the chief priests want Lazarus dead? And why were they so opposed to Jesus? You know, Lazarus was a walking testimony of the power of Jesus. He'd been dead for four days and the people knew this. And now he's alive and every time people saw him it was a reminder to them of the power of Jesus. And these teachers of the law, these priests, these you know, the, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, they were jealous of the power of Jesus. They were losing their flock to him. They, they didn't want to lose their power, their prestige. They were the ones who were supposed to be representing God. And, and here Jesus is God, and they're opposed to him. And it's just so sad because they're just concerned and jealous of the great things he's doing. They should have been celebrating. If they're the true church, church that God called upon them to be, they would have been celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, and everything would have been much different but their human pride and arrogance comes into play. And they want Jesus dead. They even want Lazarus dead. And from what we see in history, Lazarus did not live much longer after he was raised. They did actually kill him from some of the things I've read according to history. And that sounds like a terrible thing, but imagine you know, Lazarus had been in heaven. And so he probably, you know, for him, probably a good thing that he got to go back there again. You know, so often we think we want to live here on earth forever, but the bottom line is heaven is so much better. And Lazarus, one of those people that saw what heaven was like, had to come back to earth. And so I'm sure even as he lived his last days in his plans, thinking, boy, I can't wait to get back there again. Moving on, next question. What meaning can be pulled from 1224? Now basically, a, a seed that goes into the ground, it dies, and then it produces a lot of you know, seeds and a lot of it germinates into many plants. And, and, and so, like Jesus is saying, it's necessary for him to, to die, that, that more life can come forth. And, and, you know, that he's talking once again about what he's going to do. You know, in so many ways, he demonstrates this to his disciples, that it's necessary for me to die, um, and, I, and then I will rise again. And so he, he telegraphs this over and over again, but it's just so amazing when it finally gets to that point. They still are oblivious, and, and it's amazing how our minds, we need to hear things so many times until it finally begins to sink in. How does 12, 42, and 43 apply to the world today? You know, in a situation here, as so, as so often the case, people are more concerned about what others think than what God thinks. There's you know, some of the people within the church at that time that truly um, began to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But rather than stand up boldly for him, 
They were more concerned about what the other church leaders thought, that they kind of caved into their ways. They were more concerned about what they thought than about what God thought. And so often is the case in the world today. You know, people that claim to be Christian, but they're more concerned about looking cool to the world. You know, what, what, is, what do people think? And the bottom line is in the end, you know, it doesn't matter what people think. In the end, all that matters, even now, all that matters is what does God think? He's the one who created us. He's the one who saves us. He's the one that we should be living for. And, and the bottom line is, what does his word say? And, and how are we doing following what his word says? Question 7, after reading 12, 47, 48, what do we learn about judgment? You know, Jesus comes out and says he didn't come to, to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, the world is already in judgment. Okay, without Jesus, if we just have the law, we're condemned by the law. And so the, the, the word itself condemns us in ourselves. And we're all on that path by ourselves. But Jesus came along to save us, that through him he fulfills the law for us. And so by believing in Jesus, we are set free and we are saved. Whereas for those that reject him, they're still condemned by the law and sitting in judgment and still living in their sin. What lesson do we learn from Jesus washing the feet of his disciples? And he's showing an example. You know, in that day and age, they didn't have shoes like us. They didn't have paved roads. They, they walked often barefoot or in sandals, and they walked on dust, and their feet would be dirty. And so it was a tradition that servants would come and wash the feet of the people as they walked, went into a house. Like even back to John 2, those water jars that Jesus turned into wine were actually the water used to wash people's feet as they entered into the house. And Jesus basically is showing just, just as he is serving that the disciples too are to serve, to, to humble themselves, even to washing people's feet, that the God of the universe, all power, all might, became the ultimate servant as a demonstration to all of us that we are called to serve others no matter who they are. What do we learn about Judas in 1327? We, here we see that it says, you know, John brings us out that Satan entered Judas. And obviously, Judas gave in to the temptation. And so there's demonic stuff going on here with Judas. And Satan wanted Jesus dead. And the agent he chooses to try to make this happen is, is through Judas. Satan works for Judas, and he goes and he ultimately betrays Jesus. And the final question, how can we tell if someone is a disciple of Jesus? And the whole emphasis here that a true disciple is someone who loves others in the same way that Jesus loves others. That love is the key. Agape love. A love that selflessly gives to others. That as we grow to become disciples of Jesus, as we grow in the Word of God, what should be coming from us is love. Agape love. The deeper we grow in faith, the stronger the love becomes. Love for God, love for others. That's the purpose of, of Jesus, to love God and to love others. And, and it's fulfilled as he made disciples. And how were disciples made? If you go back to, to Matthew, um, he, his vision was to, to fill the world with disciples of, of, you know, for him. And how was that done? They were baptized. They were taught to obey everything that was in the word. And then they would go. And as they go, they go forth in love. Disciples go forward with love. And imagine a church filled with love. Imagine guests coming to church where people just emanated and set forth love in what they say and what they do, and people can feel it. You know, love is the most magnetic and contagious force in the world. It's what people need, and God's church is meant to be a church of love, and His people are to be people of, of love. And the more that we truly love, that's the ultimate source of being a witness of evangelism. And it's what people need. And sometimes that love um, has to be discerning. Sometimes that love may even have to be tough. But we are called upon to live in the love of, of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's the whole premise of, of what the Word of God instills in each and every one of us. The more that we grow in it, and then as the wisdom of it comes alive in us, then it comes through us in the form of love. Let's close with a word of prayer. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord God, you are love and your, your word is about love. And we pray more and more that this love fills our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit and your word um, coming more into us and your spirit helping us to live that out. And, and Lord, I, I pray for our church and all churches. I pray for each of us individually because the church is a collection of individuals that we emanate and grow in your love. And we show that love to one another within the church, but we show that love out in the world as well, that they will know we're Christians by our love. And I just pray that you help us on this pathway to discipleship to keep growing. And I thank you um, for these um, individuals going through this training, Lord, that are desiring to become disciples for you as our desire is to, to learn everything in your words so we can learn to live it out more and more and, and show forth your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.